Hi, I'm your host, Becky Davis, and you're watching GardenWise, Santa Barbara's most informative show about sustainable landscaping. It's no surprise that we live in a semi-arid climate, which is why knowing how to create and maintain waterwise landscapes is extremely valuable. Fortunately, there's a program here in Santa Barbara County teaching residents just that and helping them become masters at saving water. Uh, so this is a really uh, critical uh, part. We're going to go into it in some depth. We take basic science-based home horticulture into the community to assist homeowners with all kinds of problems in their gardens and help them with uh, resolving their problems. It's called the Master Gardeners Program, and it teaches students everything from learning the basics of what a plant needs to grow to how to best save water in your garden. The University of California uh, started this program here in 1990. The Master Gardening program has been around a lot longer than that, but uh, that's when this uh, chapter became active. Since its inception here in Santa Barbara County, an average of 25 to 50 residents have enrolled each year, creating a community of hundreds of master gardeners. We have a master gardener that if you want to talk about succulents, if you have a question about succulents, you can't find it. I'll just get online and I'll contact this master gardener. If you have an herb question, we have a person who is a chef. And after she became a chef, she became a master gardener. And she lectures all over the county on herb gardens. We have all kinds of people who have all kinds of skills. And they are able to facilitate and really refine their interests besides getting a good general education. And you don't have to be a landscape professional to become a master gardener. The program is for anyone interested in learning how to have a thriving garden. The initial interest was uh, over the years I've collected a shelf full of books and um, I haven't gleaned very much information out of that shelf of books and I thought that maybe I could broaden my scope of knowledge by being involved in this program. I love gardening, I always have. I've had successes and I've had failures and I thought it was a good opportunity at this point in my life to get some you know, actual training with people who know all about the various topics, soil, horticulture, fertilizers, composting. It's so technical and there's so much information and the more I learn, the more I realize what I don't know. <laughs> so I'm really thrilled to be in the class. The program lasts from February to June and is a blend of in-class hours, volunteer hours in the community, attendance at workshops, and homework. Whether it's a class on succulents or water conservation or composting, um, you get to go and hear people who are experts in those fields uh, lecture and then also do some hands-on experience. You get to visit people's gardens and um, what they've achieved with applying the different principles that they've learned in the program. So it's really rich in the different experiences that you can have as well. After 12 weeks of training, students become certified master gardeners, ready and willing to share their knowledge with the community. So as a graduate, you um, commit to putting in volunteer hours in the community every year and you also commit to continuing your education. So you need to get a certain amount of hours of those to, to keep your um, Master Gardener certification current. So all of the, the past trainees can either come to classes or they can go to new classes or they can teach classes, you know, however they want to get their hours. But, but one way is to come to the, the classes and, and get a brush up on what they learned. Although the program does take time and dedication, the knowledge you gain and skills you develop in the garden make it all worth it. Everything at my house now is sustainable except for an old black walnut tree and an avocado tree. I took out all the grass, the kikuyas, bushes that were basically from the east coast which need 40 inches of rain which we get in about nine years now. And then put down weed block, put mulch on it, and put California native plants in it, ceanothus, salvia, all kinds of stuff that basically you don't need to water, except when it gets really, really hot in the summer. I cut my water bill down 75% of what it used to be. Ultimately, the Master Gardeners program exists to provide the community with an excellent resource on how to solve problems in your garden. It's great because you get a chance to help people. And, you know, if you have a passion and you really enjoy gardening and you want to help people who are having a tough time with that, 
That's great. Now, I participate in the Farmer's Market Help Table and the, uh, also the Helpline. And this is a place where the community can get in touch with us or call in or email into our helpline and pose specific questions. And if we don't have the answer at the time, we will find it. We'll use the resources we have at the university as well as those at the County Agricultural Commissioner's Office to track down pest-related problems as well as vertebrate rodents. If you want to learn more about the Master Gardeners program or how to become one, call 893-3485 or visit their website. A rain sensor is a simple shutoff device that prevents an automatic sprinkler timer from turning on during and after a rainstorm. Up next, find out how they work and how simple they are to install. Hi, I'm Kathy Pere with the City of Santa Barbara's Water Conservation Program. We're going to show you today a wonderful, wonderful tool. It's called a rain shutoff sensor. Basically, it's an interrupter, so if your sprinklers are on, it starts to rain, your sprinklers turn off. Say it rained at midnight and your sprinklers are supposed to come on at 5 in the morning, you don't have to run downstairs in your pajamas to turn it off. It'll automatically interrupt the watering cycle, keep it off for two or three days so that it gives you a convenient time to go down and turn your controller to off. I'll show you a couple little things here about the rain sensor itself before we install it. The rain sensor is actually composed of a stack of little felt wafers in here. When the rain comes in through the top, you get about a quarter of an inch, it'll swell those little wafers up and it'll depress a switch which interrupts the electrical current going from your controller out to the valves in your irrigation. You want to close that down almost to the end so that it'll stay wet, it won't dry out quite as quick and it'll keep your controller in the off mode for three to four days. Before you install this on your roof, you can test it. There's a little push up button right in here. Once it's wired in, you want to turn your controller on to see the water come on. You push the button down and hold it. That will depress that on off switch. Your sprinklers will shut off, let it go. The sprinklers will come back on. You know you have it wired properly and it's going to work the next time it rains. The rain sensor is a very easy device to install. It has two wires. That's all that you need to connect to your controller. There's no polarity, so there's no shock. You can connect the red wire first and then the black, or the black wire and then the red. It really doesn't matter. You're going to open the front of your controller face. You're going to look for the jumper wire. Sometimes it's yellow. This one's black. And underneath, it'll usually say sensor, sensor, or it'll say RS, RS for rain sensor. Use your little screwdriver to remove that jumper wire. Then you'll replace that jumper wire with one of the rain sensor wires in one port, the other rain sensor wire in the other port. That's all there is to it. Your rain sensor is ready to roll. We've got it on manual. The sprinklers are on. So, and you can see on here, my sensor is active. When I push the buttons down, the red light goes to red, and my sprinkler's turned off. It's assuming it rained. Release it, goes back to green light, the sprinklers come back on, the electricity's running through this, and it's running again. One last bit of advice, when you install this, you don't want to put it under the eaves, you don't want to put it under trees. It needs to actually be in the rain so that it has a clear shot facing up. I have had people install it upside down so the rain would run out, but that's not the way it goes. So, easy to do, run it through the hole, attach it through those two sensor terminals, take your wire, run it up. I would put it on the outside of my patio, but depending on your house, you'll have to see what's the easiest way to get to. For more information about rain sensors, visit santabarbaraca.gov slash waterwise. Up next, we explore the garden of Master Gardener Dina McMillian to learn all about succulents and an easy way to get more for free. Hi, my name is Dina McMillian and I'm a certified Master Gardener with Santa Barbara County. We're here in my garden today to talk about growing succulents. The ease and versatility of growing them, using them in your landscape to provide interest and to reduce water dependency, and we'll even talk about propagation. So why grow succulents? Well, for one thing, they're easy to grow, they're beautiful, and you're creating a sculptural landscape rather than just a flat, dry lawn. In my garden, I've created this tapestry 
of beautiful colors and shapes. And look at these flowers. These last for months. There's no pruning, no deadheading, no real water necessary. So the first thing that you want to do when you're deciding to start your project is decide what your goal is. Now I knew for me, the first thing is that I wanted to remove my lawn so that I could save water. But that seemed really scary in the beginning. So I started off by creating a succulent pocket garden, just a small area that I could concentrate the plants and decide which plants I liked, how well they responded to the light conditions and the lack of water. Because my goal is to have a dry garden and not use irrigation. Another thing that you have to determine is the placement of the plants. So when choosing placement for your succulents in the garden, what I like to do is I like to bring my plants right out in the pot and just kind of place them around in areas so that I get a kind of a feel for what they're going to look like. Is the height right? Is the color right? Is the placement right? So that I can walk around it for a few days or sometimes for a few weeks. So now that we've talked about how we're going to plant our garden, let's talk a little bit more about the plants and propagation or how to get free plants. So just about all of the plants that you see in this area, in this segment, are plants that I started from cuttings. Once your garden is established, even though you don't have to prune, I call it cut, cutting pruning. So I can go around the garden with my clippers and clip off little pieces that I can then put in pots and propagate and share with others. Because that's the whole fun about succulents anyway, is that you can share them. Here's a box of things that I went through in my garden. Some of them maybe didn't look as good. I cleaned up, you know, this one didn't, maybe didn't like where I had it growing. So I pull it out. Doesn't mean I'm gonna throw it away. It looks a little rough, but I can still put that in a pot, put it in my nursery, and in no time it could come back. Here's a jade plant cutting. It was just getting a little bit long. I cut that now, and all I have to do is put it in a pot, and I'll show you how easy that is. So this particular aeonium has gotten quite long. So I'm not gonna be able to plant this in the garden like this. So I know it's hard, but get your clippers out and clip it down about one inch above the soil line. Just do a nice clean clip and set that aside in your nursery. And in no time, you're going to have brand new pups. So here's an aeonium that I cut, I think maybe about eight weeks ago. And look at all of those brand new babies. Then clip off the stem, clip off your rosettes. Now you can put them aside and wait till later, or you can go ahead and just put them right in the soil, nice and close down in and those will root and be new plants in no time flat. So here's another example of a, a different variety of aloe and how the plantlets grow. So you can really see they grow right on the stem of the mother plant. And now this one, I've, or this was a cutting that someone gave me. So now I'm going to create a dozen at least new plants from this. So you just, once you have it out of the ground, it's so much easier just to go in and pull these little pups off. They're called plantlets, but in the nursery world, we like to call them pups. And we just pull them off. And so now all of these little plantlets are ready to be planted in new pots. And the mother plant will also just stick it right in the ground and it'll grow and make more pups. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about soil. Before we plant up our cuttings, we've got to make sure that they have the right place to thrive. And that's in a beautiful, fast draining soil. Now, succulents love to grow, but they don't like to sit in water. So you're gonna want a good 50-50 mix of a nice organic mixture and something like a pumice or maybe a gravel to make space and air in the, so I just add a little bit of pumice. Even if you buy already pre-mixed cactus and succulent mix, I always like to add a little bit more of the pumice. And then you recycle your old nursery pots, fill it up. 
You know, I wanted to get leggy, so see how this has gotten real long? All I have to do is break it off and place it in the soil. And it's as simple as that. Okay, let's talk about those broken off leaves now. When I'm working in the garden, I don't have time to stop and deal with every little thing. So I usually just take them and I throw them in a little pot and I stick them under my workbench and I go back to them on another day. So today, I'm gonna go through all the leaves that I've been saving up and see if there, any of these are ready to um, place on some soil. Oh, look at this. Here's one that's already started growing. Probably can't see, but some of these even have roots already. Little plants have already started growing on these leaves that I threw in here a few weeks ago. Okay, so really, here's a few that I placed on the soil and they're already have gotten this big. So this is the original leaf before it started growing the new plant. And, it, and the new plant uses the nutrients in the leaf to, to live on. And then once it gets a little bit bigger, then this will shrivel up and drop away. And you can see the little roots here. And then this is plenty big enough to now stick in your plot and start a new plant. So I hope you've enjoyed your little peek into my garden and I, you've learned some new things today and I've inspired you to go out and get maybe your first plant. We'll see you in the garden. If you wanna learn more about propagating succulents, call the Master Gardener's Helpline at 893-3485. We'll be right back with more Garden Wise. Now that warmer weather is here, we check our sprinklers to make sure they're working right and water wise. Turn on your sprinklers during the day to see how they're working. Make sure there's no water running onto your driveway or sidewalk. Redirect spray heads to keep the water in your landscaping. Look for broken sprinklers and make repairs as needed. Save water and money. Learn how at waterwisesb.org. Let's save together. We are in a serious drought, so it's time to get water wise. Did you know that in Santa Barbara County, 60% of residential water use is used in gardens, and half that is wasted through overwatering and runoff? Take a day off from watering your landscape and only water your thirstiest plants, such as your lawn, no more than two days a week. Go what is the new green in Santa Barbara County. Your water provider is here to help. Visit waterwisesb.org for more information. Welcome back. In our next segment, we talk to horticulturist Bruce Reed about his favorite plant and find out why it's perfect for any water-wise garden. Hi, I'm Bruce Reed. I'm the horticulturalist here at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden in Santa Barbara County. And I'm here to talk to you about one of my favorite drought tolerant plants, hummingbird sage. Behind me here is a really large colony of hummingbird sage, Salvia spathacea. It's a beautiful plant. It is uh, perennial and uh, evergreen although it does kind of shrink into itself in the worst of the summer. And one of the uh, really beautiful things about this plant is how its uh, bloom stalks are these groups of whorls of blooms. So little small magenta colored blooms. Hummingbirds go crazy for them, but so do a lot of other important insects like butterflies and, and others. Hummingbird sage is native to California uh, and is more common in uh, Southern California than other parts of the state. It kind of peters out uh, by the time you reach San Francisco. So this is really a, very much a Southern California plant. And where you find it the most is in dry shade, which is, uh, as most people who are managing gardens know, that's a hard uh, position to fill sometimes. Uh, it loves a drought situation uh, in full shade. So oak forests is uh, the most common place that you'll see this in the wild. You can also get it to grow in full sun, as it is right here behind me, as long as it's getting some additional water in the summertime. So uh, hummingbird sage is uh, surprisingly drought tolerant. You'll find it doing beautifully out in the wild, getting no rainfall between March and October. So for all that long, hot period, 
Uh, it's getting almost no irrigation, almost no water, and is in uh, direct competition with oak trees, which are some of the best competitors for water. Many people will put them on drip irrigation, and that's just fine. So a single plant, the leafy portion of the plant, never gets more than about three feet tall. And in bloom, uh, maybe another foot or a foot and a half beyond that. Now wide is a little bit more hard to uh, specify because it is a spreading plant. And as I say, this large planting here may have started from a single plant. So, you know, a single plant four feet across, easily. And indefinitely larger than that over time. Like nearly all California natives, uh, fall is by far the best time to plant. Uh, there's kind of this golden window between September and December uh, when you really should be planting. This plant begins its new growth in the fall when the rains begin, but it is an evergreen plant. It's there all year round. And as it begins to grow and spread and proliferate, it begins to send up these bloom stalks early, uh, sometimes as early as February and March, but really by April it's usually in full gear. And this kind of salmony magenta pink flower is common of the hummingbird sage. It actually works as a cut flower as well, and so some people like the look of the bloomed out inflorescences, the flower stalks. Um, and so depending on how that uh, appeals to you aesthetically, uh, you might want to get rid of them or, or leave them be. Um, so a little deadheading, uh, removal of perhaps the worst of the old leaves, and that's about all you need to do. It's really very trouble free. To learn even more about hummingbird sage, visit sanmarcosgrowers.com. Up next, we visit the home of another master gardener to explore her tasty garden and learn how to create a thriving one of her own. So this is the garden. And this is a little garden, but it really is amazing that I have here, I think I have over 400 herbs. The wonderful thing about an herb garden is that you don't have to go to the supermarket and buy for $2 or sometimes even more, a little bunch of chives like this, which you will use a little bit, they will wilt in three days and they're gone. So here I have fresh every single day. I don't have to think about herbs. I never buy them. When you buy an herb in the, in the supermarket, it's already three days old and it hardly has any taste compared to the ones that grow in your yard. We had this garden, we moved in, and nothing was growing here, nothing. So when I finished working as a pastry chef, I decided, okay, the garden would be a good idea to see what's, what's happening and take classes. I learned the most important thing is that the soil in your, in your garden is everything. You will have healthy plants, always if your soil is healthy and mine wasn't my garden was clay when you fix your soil because you have all clay soil in santa barbara don't take the clay away don't just kind of bring bring all new soil you have to fix what you have or it won't work and uh, the the and clay is good because clay keeps holds water so you need a little bit of clay you need compost so it holds water too you want the water to drain for that, you, you make a hole, like a gallon of milk, and you make that hole, you fill it with water, and once the water is all gone, you fill it again. And if it takes more than eight hours to drain, then you need to fix your soil. The next step in the process is really important, start small. Don't start big, see if you like it, see how much time it takes. So I started with these two beds, the front two beds, that was it. And I started liking it. So then I went, I went to the next two beds. The next year I went two more and the next year the rest. Which herbs to buy? First, you have to make a list of what you like to eat. So what are the herbs that you're buying in the supermarket right now? Those are the first ones you have to, to plant. And plant probably what? Cilantro, chives, uh, thyme, oregano, and basil. So you start with the ones that you are buying all the time in the supermarket, and then you'll taste them here. You can buy them in the supermarket and taste those, and then you realize, okay, I'm never going back. We have a couple of basils here. I have others over there. This is a pesto basil, and these are the sweet Italian basil, or Genovese. So I will take a stem, and when you are cutting down your plant, 
you don't want to pinch here because that does nothing. It will flower anyway. You have to go way down and where these nodules are, where you have two leaves coming up, you, can, you have to cut just above that. Okay, there. And then you, your plant in two weeks will grow back. And so make sure that you can, you can cut as down as you want. It doesn't matter, but as long as you cut on top of the nodules, then you'll be fine and you'll have basil all summer. You can also cut a stem. You put it in water and it will root in uh, probably seven days. And then you bring it out and you can have all summer the clone. You know, if you like the plant, then you'll have this all summer. You shouldn't plant any herbs from seed because it won't work. They cross pollinate. So when you get the seeds, you don't know what you're getting. And in general, 95% of the time, it won't be what you think and it will be tasteless. So if you go to a, to a nursery, taste it. And if you like it, buy it. Herbs are easy to grow. They are not like vegetables. They don't, first of all, I don't fertilize them. I, I do put only when I plant them, at the point when I plant them, I make a hole. I put a li uh, one handful of blood meal, one ha a handful of bone meal. I fill the, the, the hole with water and put the plant in and that's it. There's no more fertilizer in the life of that plant. You have to think when you are watering your garden that all of these roots, especially the annuals, are not more than a foot deep. So you're not going to be watering there for half an hour watering and watering, watering what? So just if you keep in mind that you're watering one foot, that's it. You shouldn't be touching any of the leaves. They hate that. So I would put water here on the root of the plant. And just for this plant, I just leave it there. Make sure that I don't water anything else, just the plant. And then maybe on this side also. And that's it. And this one really doesn't want any more water for two weeks. If you were to water only very little, you think you're saving water, but the, plant, the, the roots of the plant will come all the way up and the plant will get sick. Where like this, if the roots are deep, the water stays there because of the compost. Herbs need a haircut constantly. They like it. Like if you let them grow wild, they, first they don't look good. The perennials, you really can cut as much as you want. In the winter, be a little bit more careful because if you want to eat from that plant all winter, then, you know, just don't, like in the summer, I don't care. I, two weeks and it's all back. But in the, in the winter, I'm a little bit more careful to, you, to take what I, I will use. The annuals are the ones that you have to cut constantly. Once they flower, they're over. So you, you have to keep harvesting them so they don't flower, especially basil. When a plant is stressed, they will immediately get pests and diseases. If and the plant gets stressed because the, it, something is wrong with the soil or something is wrong with your watering. I have all beneficial uh, insects here. M my garden is 100% organic, so nothing hurts them. I will not put anything in it that uh, I can't eat from the box. So there's nothing, right? Nothing, only water. So I make sure that my plants attract also the beneficial insects. That's really important to me and it's very important to sit there. And this is my little theater. And I look at the hummingbirds and I look at the bees. And I tell you, it's impossible to be depressed that way. From beauty to low maintenance, there are many benefits to having an herb garden. But perhaps the most rewarding is getting to finally taste the fruits of your labor. And don't worry if you're limited on space. Up next, we'll show you a creative way to have an herb garden that maximizes space and saves water. A hugel culture bed is essentially a garden bed that's built on rotting logs. So it's a permaculture practice that's been used in Germany and Eastern Europe for centuries and has become more popular here in the United States in the last couple decades and more recently in the last couple years. Uh, and the concept is to build a garden that doesn't require any irrigation or fertilization or tilling. This is the Hugel culture bed within our edible demonstration garden. Uh, as you can see, it's really thriving right now in spring. We have some lemon thyme here, some lavender, 
and um, some sage. And we also recently planted some peppers and some cilantro. And then we have poppies that are native to California. On the top of the bed, you can see that we have gorilla hair mulch, which is really fine. Uh, and that's why it sticks so well to the mound. And then we bordered the bed with stones. You see uh, in other beds, you'll see it bordered either with logs or with stones. Hugo culture beds are um, really easy to maintain and they're really great at conserving water. So the main benefits are that they retain moisture, um, they provide a consistent long-term source of nutrients and um, aeration of the soil. And the concept is relatively simple. The logs within the bed decompose over time and when it rains in the winter and spring they absorb the water like a sponge and then release it over time during the dry summer months. As the logs decompose they also provide nutrients for the plants in the soil and uh, air pockets and aeration for the soil. So it's easy to maintain, it conserves water and it's really a self-sustaining garden. Thinking of growing your own herb garden? The Herb Society of America is a great resource. Just visit their website at herbsociety.org. Up next, we have another horrifying crime to solve with landscape architect and author, Billy Goodnick. The story you're about to see is true. The location of these plants has been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city, Santa Barbara, California. Some call it paradise. Mountains and ocean views, classic architecture and exotic gardens. But drive down any street in any neighborhood and you'll find them there, sometimes in broad daylight. People perpetrating pointlessly pitiful pruning on peaceful plants. My name is Billy Goodnick and I run the Crimes Against Horticulture Division. Actually, there's no such thing, but wouldn't it be cool if there were? My mission is to help my community create beautiful, useful, sustainable landscapes. Plants that don't look like a bunch of UFOs, meatballs, and hockey pucks. It was a chilly Thursday morning, an early winter drizzle misting over Santa Barbara's rooftops and windshields. A good day to stay inside and catch up on reports. Little did I know my day was going to be shaken after Jane dropped off a new case with a twist. Okay, I've seen some deviant garden behavior in my life, but never such an example of breaking plant code 432, use of excessive restraint for horticultural gratification. Okay, the first offense is it just looks downright weird, maybe even kinky. Another problem is that cargo straps don't stretch, which is why we see up in this corner, it's starting to cut into the branches of the tree. Now what that does is reduces the amount of fluids that can run up and down the plant and that eventually weakens the plant. You can even see this branch falling off at some point. The other problem here is that this form of rigid staking makes the plant completely dependent on the stake for the rest of its life and that's not a good thing. One way to prevent excessive staking is to reduce the canopy of the tree initially and open it up so that it doesn't have to bear so much weight and that the wind can move through it. Another thing is that most trees that you buy in a commercial nursery are staked only for the purposes of growing them, so they're, they're tied very tightly to the stake. Uh, what we want to do is remove the, the nursery training stake, get a more stout stake, and put it away from the plant enough that we can use this sort of tie to gently tie the plant, just enough to support it, but allowing it to move a little bit with the breezes. That way the trunk gets stronger over time and it's not dependent on the stake. And once the tree is able to support itself, just remove the stake and let the plant do its thing. Now in this case, it looks like the tree separated and started forking early on. And there's a really good chance that the reason it was staked that way, the reason it was tied up, is because it started splitting. If that does occur and you notice uh, a severe split in the crotch of any branch or base of a tree, time to call a certified arborist, have the tree inspected for safety reasons. Well, it looks like the streets of Santa Barbara are safe again. Jane, if you wouldn't mind filing this. And, uh, you know, why don't you take the rest of the day off? I'm going to have some fun doing some shredding of my own. Well, that does it for this episode. Remember, you are the agent of change, and together we can conserve water and create beautiful, climate-appropriate gardens. There are lots of resources online to help. 
Visit waterwisesb.org for landscaping ideas or to view past episodes. If you have any questions or comments about the show, you can give us a call at 564-5311. I'm your host, Becky Davis, and keep it waterwise, Santa Barbara.